I'm here to talk about consumer product regulation. And uh, in some sense, what I'd like to do is, is say, well, uh, people should be free to purchase what they like to purchase. People should be free to sell what they have to sell. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> but I think a little more is expected of me than that, and I'd like to give you a little more um, to chew on here. Let me start by saying that um, one of the books that has made an impact on me in, in understanding some of this is Power and Market by Murray Rothbard. Now, there are some copies, I think, of just the paperback Power and Market, and, and now I found that uh, I can buy um, Man, Economy, and State, and it's got Power and Market in the back. Um, I, I saw that, and I upgraded my copy. I had the old yellow paperback copy of Man, Economy, and State, and I was really happy to find that, um, that I can, can uh, get a better edition of it. But Rothbard, in this book, mentions three types of intervention. Autistic, binary, and triangular. Autistic intervention is intervention by an aggressor, and when, when Rothbard's talking about intervention or aggressors, he doesn't mean only the government, although this can be an aggressor. But autistic intervention is intervention in which the aggressor gets nothing in exchange. So homicide would be an example of autistic intervention. Uh, if I'm an aggressor and I kill someone, it's not like I get something out of that exchange. Now, if I rob someone and kill them, that maybe I get something out of that. But that would be binary, binary intervention. Binary intervention would include robbery. It would include taxation. It would include conscription, where you're drafted into the military or drafted into some sort of public service, drafted into a jury. That's conscription. If the state can compel you to perform some activity for the state's benefit, that's binary intervention. But what I would like to talk about here is triangular intervention. Triangular intervention is inter interfering with two other parties. You, the government might come along and say, well, you and you are about to enter into some trade, but we've got something we want to say about how that trade is going to be conducted. Either we're going to change the price, we're going to put it in a price floor, price ceiling, or we're going to change the terms. We're going, to, we're going to dictate to you what the terms of that contract ought to be. Or, and more to the point for what we're doing here this afternoon, the government might dictate the qualities of the product. The government might say, well, you're not allowed to sell this product to that willing consumer with those product characteristics. You've got to change it somehow. Make it more fuel efficient, or you've got to make it more safe, or you've got to uh, leave this ingredient out. One example, um, which I ran across just this morning, appeared on uh, lewrockwell.com today, and I mentioned this in my health economics class earlier this morning, but there's apparently a, a technology that's come about where you can put this cigarette-looking device in your mouth and, and it emits this kind of nicotine vapor, which is supposed to be a substitute for a cigarette. So people who are trying to quit smoking cigarettes can use this device and it doesn't produce any tar, it doesn't produce some of the other uh, toxins that cigarettes might produce. And uh, so for a lot of people, this might be a, a much better substitute for cigarettes. Well, then the FDA came along and said, well, this has diethylene glycol in it. Not to mention that a lot of other things have diethylene glycol in them, like the aspirin that I took a few hours ago it has diethylene glycol in it. Um, there are a lot of things that have diethylene glycol, but the government says, the FDA says, we're not going to allow this product to be sold until we have tested it. If you've got a choice between consuming something that has nicotine and none of the tar, or nicotine and all of the tar, which one do you think is better for you? Well, there's 3,000 chemicals in tobacco smoke, so 
Uh, in that case, the government's trying to dictate the composition of what you put into your body in a way that is probably detrimental to you in a practical sense and is certainly detrimental in the sense of robbing you of your liberty. Let me make clear from the start that my objective in evaluating some of these regulations is to promote liberty. Now, I'm going to mention some, some dollar figures here. People have tried to come up with costs, and I think that that can be illustrative of some of the problems. But it should not be sufficient for us. We should be able to look at a, a regulation and say, well, regardless of what you have calculated as far as the costs and the benefits of this regulation, it is a violation of your rights to your person and your property for this regulation to be in place. So our objective is different, I think, fundamentally. Our, our, our method is different than the mainstream economist who will study demand curves and supply curves and elasticities and try very hard to come up with dollar figures and then decide, oh, well, in this case, government intervention makes sense, and in that case, it doesn't. I think there are some very severe problems, which hopefully you covered earlier in the week, with trying to make interpersonal utility comparisons and with trying to measure these costs. Costs and benefits are subjective. They defy measurement. Now, Rothbard says that quality standards in production, which would include safety standards, impose governmental definitions on products, and they require businesses to ad adhere to the specifications of government. So if somebody says, uh, uh, um, I'm going to sell this person bread, the government's going to intervene, it's triangular intervention, and say, well, we're going to define what bread is. And if you put this in it, it's bread, and if you don't put this in it, it's not bread. In fact, that's, that's removing potential improvements from uh, the market. Rothbard says this is supposed to keep us safe. In fact, it prohibits change by forcing people to adhere to the definition. Now, one thing to, to recognize here is that, is that if an entrepreneur offers some innovative product to consumers and the consumers accept it, it's, it's a successful sale to consumers. By definition, this is an improvement. Rothbard says that if you have quality standards set down by the government, this shifts decisions about quality from the consumers to government boards. It imposes rigidities, monopolization, and so forth on the economic system. Safety codes. Who can be opposed to safety? We, I like safety. Um, I, I don't like incurring risk unnecessarily. But safety codes, like as, as with building codes, impose another kind, of <clears throat> another kind of quality standard. They say, this is how you must produce. Any differences, any variations from this method are a violation of the law. Now, a free market method of dealing with safety, say a building issue, uh, you don't want a building to fall down on your head. Um, so how, how, does a, how does a market handle that kind of potential problem? Well, if a building collapses and kills people, then you send the owner, uh, Rothbard says, you send the owner of the building to jail. I, I, I'm not a real big fan of jail, but some kind of, of compensation of the victims or the heirs of the victims for manslaughter, unintentional death. Uh, but the market cannot countenance any kind of um, arbitrary safety code put in place to dictate how buildings have to be constructed. We're not going to have, I don't know if you ever saw the movie, um, uh, Minority Report. Uh, there's this whole 
a pre-crime issue. We're going to arrest people for something they were going to do. We're pretty sure they were going to do it because we had psychics that said they were going to do it. So we don't have pre-crime in a free market system. We don't prosecute people or put restrictions on them prior to some wrong being committed. And then you say, well, that means you just have to wait for people to die before uh, you do anything about it. Only in a very narrow sense could you say that. Because, of course, um, uh, I, I, cannot be, um, I, mean, I cannot be prosecuted for something I did not do, but I am deterred from doing something that's going to harm other people by the prospect of some kind of, of uh, penalty. Now, uh, some more concrete examples here. Get your teeth into this a little bit. Auto safety. This fellow here, um, this older picture from the 1970s, but that's Ralph Nader. I appreciate a few things that Ralph Nader has done. He was um, active in protesting uh, war, and, and um, I, I don't like war either, so that's, that's fine. Um, but in 1965, Mr. Nader produced a book on automobile safety called Unsafe at Any Speed. And he focused on the problems of uh, quality problems, safety problems of cars produced by the American automobile industry. And in particular, there was one car that, that, that was criticized called a Corvair. This was a rear engine compact car. And uh, Nader argued that it tended to roll too easily, and so it was unsafe, he said. Now, I think he was quite, quite likely uh, wrong on the, the objective. Um, facts of, of the car's tendencies. Um, years later, uh, there were some independent tests done of the Corvair, which showed that it didn't really behave any worse than other similar-sized cars on the road at that time. Um, however, Nader's book performed the same sort of function as Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, which I'll mention a little later. It prepped the American people for regulation. Somehow the automobile industry is out to kill you, and uh, because of this we need to make sure that they don't by imposing these regulations. Now, there was a National Traffic Motor Vehicle Safety Act in the 1960s which set up this new agency, regulatory agency, that would, that would tell automakers what they had to do, and it required uh, seat belts which had previously been optional, uh, dual brake systems, padded dashboards, and impact-absorbing steering columns. Now, I like more safety in my car, and given the choice, I'd pay extra to have a car that has seatbelts. I'd pay extra to have a car that has a frangible steering column, a breakable steering column, so that if I'm hit from the front end, I don't have the steel rod pointed straight at my chest um, behind the steering wheel that's going to impale me. I, I don't like that, uh, being impaled. And, and nevertheless, it's, it's um, uh, not ideal to have the government deciding what level of safety is appropriate. I think it's entirely likely that either contemporaneously with, with Nader's book, or very shortly thereafter, in the absence of regulation, you would have seen the automobile industry starting to adopt some of these, these safety improvements. Um, they were providing, the automobile industry was providing what people wanted. And I mentioned in an earlier lecture of mine that what people want can be a very complex set of priorities. What, what kind of... More safety in a car is not always better because you cannot add safety without incurring an opportunity cost. Something else is going to have to give. What do people look for in a car? Well, I mean, there's safety, there's fuel economy, there's capacity, there's performance, there's style, there's uh, low cost of the, the car initially, there's... Um, uh, towing capacity, there all kinds of things, low maintenance requirements on the vehicle. So what combination 
of those features do people want? If the government's going to require more safety features, that means something else is being sacrificed. Either the car is going to get more expensive or it's going to get heavier, it's going to get more, um, uh, the gas mileage is going to drop, or a number of other things will change. Now, one of the classic examples, I mentioned this briefly in another talk as well. I'll go into a little more detail here. This is the Ford Pinto. And in the 1970s, this is after the regulation, uh, the Nader-induced regulation, um, there were some accidents involving the Pinto wherein wherein the car was rear-ended. And because of a number of things, the placement of the fuel tank and the absence of some kind of... um, uh, fire-resistant technology, uh, the car tended to, to burst into flame when it was hit from behind. Um, and, and business ethics classes routinely cover this as an example of, of a firm that put profits ahead of safety, and this is terrible, and so forth, and this is immoral on the part of the car manufacturer. They noted in the trial that it would take $11 per car to put in an improvement that would have avoided this kind of accident or the, this kind of consequence to an accident, fire. Now, $11 doesn't sound like a whole lot to save a human life. Certainly not. didn't seem unreasonable for people to pay an additional $11. However... Of course, they would have to put it into every car because they don't know which ones will be involved in the accidents and which ones won't. And after you tally up the $11 times however many cars they produce, you get a very large number. And if you count up the uh, evident values that people place on their own lives uh, and multiply that by the number of lives that were likely to be lost in this sort of accident, you find that the the costs, as judged by Ford, were not likely to exceed the benefits. Now, in hindsight, Ford would, would most likely say, well, we didn't count all the costs that we would incur because of this. Uh, we got a terrible reputation because of it. We wish we had done otherwise. But given the information they had, that's what they, had, and that's what they did. Um, regulators seem to treat human lives as if they are infinitely valuable. And I've had conversations with students. I'll have a class in front of me, and I'll say, now, how much is your life worth? And I generally have one or two students who will raise their hand, and they'll say, well, my life's of infinite value. I I can't put a price on my life. Now, I I will agree that it's very difficult for people to put some sort of dollar figure on on your own life. I I have no idea what my life is worth but I'm pretty sure it's not infinite. How do I know that? Well, I drove four hours to get here from South Carolina, where I, where I teach, where I live. There's some tiny chance that I could have been killed on the road down here. What benefit do I receive from teaching here at Mises University for a week? Well, I do receive a benefit, that's for sure, but it's not infinite. <laughs> so uh, let's say the, the, the I don't know, Precisely, but let's say the risk of my losing my life on the road down here is one in a uh, hundred thousand. What's one over one hundred thousand times infinity? <laughs> infinity. Thank you. Somebody can do math. Good. All right. We do allow math here occasionally. All right. Infinity. So that means the, co- the expected cost to me of being here, co- traveling down here, is infinite if, in fact, my life is of infinite value. There's nothing, no compensation that I could receive that, that would offset that infinite cost. So I either have to conclude that I'm terribly irrational every time I get in my car to go anywhere, or my life is, in fact, not infinitely valuable. And what Ford was doing is they were saying, well, people's lives aren't of infinite value. We have limited resources. we got to decide where to put the resources in a way that will give people the combination of things they wanted. 
$11 doesn't sound like a lot. But then you could probably strengthen the frame for $17, and you could probably add a little bit to the brakes dimensions for another $27, and you could put a little more padding in the dashboard for $3, and you can do that at the margin thousands and thousands of times. In an uncountable number of times, you could make little improvements here and there. Where do you stop making the improvements? At some point, you're going to stop. You're going to decide, well, that next $5 is not worth it. Because if you keep going and you say, well, there's no point where we would say $5 is not worth it or $11 is not worth it. Well, before long, you don't have a, a Ford Pinto. You've got an armored personnel carrier. <laughs> A quarter million dollar armored personnel carrier. I I drive a little car. It's a compact little car. I get incredible gas mileage. I'm really happy about it. I have been in an accident in that car. It's not fun. And I realize that when I get in that car and drive down the road, I'm taking a greater risk than I would be if I had a car like my neighbor's who has a an older Hummer. If he hits something, then he's probably not going to worry about it too much. So he's made a different kind of trade-off than I have. I, I drive a lot. And so I, I put a relatively, higher, a relatively high priority on, on gas mileage and on low maintenance. And so I chose a car that reflects my priorities. Ford did not represent the Pinto, as far as I know, as other than what it was. They sold a car. It's not an infinitely safe car. It was not an infinitely safe car. It was an inexpensive car. It doesn't take a whole lot for people to recognize that an inexpensive Ford Pinto is probably not going to be as safe as uh, a Volvo or some other more sturdily built car. Now... Let's move on here to the FDA. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt here. Um, I run into a lot. <laughs> thank you. I, I run into a lot of people, believe it or not, who who just love Teddy Roosevelt, and they think, well, this is this is a man's man, you know, going out in safaris and and uh, you know charging up hills in Cuba. And why were we in Cuba? Well, that's another story, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, the Rough Riders. And so he, he uh, while he was um, in the presidency in the White House, was very aggressive in promoting a progressive regulatory agenda. An excellent article to read on this is a Mises Daily article from 1998 by Bill Anderson, where Bill uh, talks about the the history of the FDA and Roosevelt's part in it. And a lot of this section I get from, from uh, Bill. And uh, you can certainly look that up if you like. But uh, Dr. Anderson says that Roosevelt targeted the meatpacking industry because of a grudge that he had from back in his Spanish-American War days. And Dr. Anderson says that at the turn of the century, refrigeration was rare, although there were ways of uh, chilling uh, meats for, for transportation on trains and ships. Um, and during the Spanish-American War, the meat packers would ship dressed meats to Cuba for distribution to the troops. The meats would be unloaded at the ports. The meat packers would then tell the Army quartermasters, you've got to keep this on ice or it will spoil. It's tropical heat. Well, the uh, quartermasters didn't listen. They sent the meat wagons into the fields. And uh, as one would expect, by the time it got to the troops, it was um, not wholesome to eat. Um, Well, so then, who who do we blame for this? Well, obviously, it's the meat packing companies, right, who are trying to profiteer. Terrible thing, you know, making profits profiteering off of this rotten meat and trying to poison the troops and all kinds of uh, uh, terrible motives. Roosevelt took this into the presidency with him, and when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, which was a fictional 
uh, account of the uh, meatpacking industry, and this book came out in 1906, Roosevelt had the public opinion enough that he could act to regulate the, the uh, meatpacking industry and, 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 in fact, the entire food processing industry with the Food and Drug Act, which came out in 1906. Upton Sinclair was a socialist. He wanted to convert Americans to socialism. Theodore Roosevelt was a, an ally of, of uh, Sinclair in this endeavor. Now, the jungle was pure fiction, but Roosevelt commissioned a study, an investigation of the meatpacking industry, and he says, he said, go out and find this Act, this, this unsavory activity that this industry is um, committing against the American people. Now, the, the, the report was later delivered to Roosevelt, and, and Dr. Anderson points out that it was not released to the public. Uh, the president just looked at it and said, oh, well, these are devastating, devastating uh, criticisms of the meatpacking industry. This is, it's clear they're... they're uh, uh, activities are detrimental to the public interest, and so therefore we need to pass the Pure Food and Drug Act. And that created the FDA. The FDA gradually gained power. I mentioned in my talk this morning uh, a number of amendments to the Food and Drug Act that up through the 1960s gave the Food and Drug Act more and more authority. Now, when Sinclair, Upton Sinclair, visited the White House in 1906... Roosevelt was a little more frank with him than he was with the American people. He said, the report that I got from the meatpacking industry didn't contain anything incriminating. But we still have this idea that the great Teddy Roosevelt reformed the meatpacking industry and gave us regulation that was desperately needed in order to, in order to promote the safety and the health of the American people. What we actually see from the FDA is a restriction on healthful innovations. I, I, um, there's a, another uh, great article here about Patrick Weinart uh, from 1998. It appeared in the free market, and you can look it up online. I won't go through all the details, but he points out that the FDA has stood in the way of innovations in food processing that would probably reduce food poisoning incidents. Some 250 people every year die from food poisoning just from E. coli alone. And there are some tens of thousands of hospitalizations and, and illnesses that are, that are uh, caused by food poisoning. Well... The FDA dragged its feet for years in approving irradiation as a means of removing the bacteria from processed food. Now, you're perfectly free to say, well, I don't want my food to be zapped by radiation. I don't, I don't think that's good for me. Fine. If, if you don't want your food irradiated, I'm sure you can find places where it's not. But it's pretty clear that irradiation tends to reduce the risk of food poisoning. And the FDA refused to allow certain types of food to be irradiated even after these results uh, became obvious, after these beneficial results became obvious. There was some three-year delay uh, in the approval of irradi irradiation, which probably resulted in thousands of avoidable deaths and cases of illness. Now, um, in my class on regulation that I teach, I spend a good bit of time on this topic on the left of the screen here, that you can't do just one thing. And you might call this risk-risk analysis. It doesn't matter to me what you call it, but there are, there, there are many, many cases in which regulators will back away from one risk into another risk 
that was more severe. You can't do this without doing this. Let me give you a little test here. I know you're not accustomed to tests, but let me just ask you. This is a question that I put on my tests in my regulation class. Let's suppose government regulators come up with a fireplace safety act. So everybody who owns a home that has a fireplace, an operating fireplace, is going to be required under this new regulation. This is fictional, by the way. Don't go quoting me saying, well, you know, the government's going to come up with this new regulation. All right, this is fictional. They may already have it. I don't know. Regulations are just so voluminous I can't keep up. Probably wrote one in Washington this morning. All right, so Fireplace Safety Act. We're going to require all homeowners to have an annual inspection from a certified chimney sweep. I don't know who might lobby for this. Uh, chimney sweep? Uh, okay. All right. And cleaning if necessary. So this would prevent chimney fires. Chimney fires, and this is actually true, accounted for some 6% of home heating fires in 2005. And failure to clean the chimneys accounted for about two-thirds of those. So we're looking at maybe, uh, if you multiply this by the number of deaths per year from home fires, we're looking at maybe five deaths per year in the United States from chimney fires that might be prevented by law that requires the cleaning, regular cleaning of your chimney. Okay, five deaths. All right, well, I, I like to save lives. If I can save five people's lives, isn't that a good thing? Sure. But you can't just do one thing. What's going to happen when you put this regulation in place and you say, okay, every year you're going to have somebody up on your chimney sweeping it out and uh, cleaning it and so forth, and we're going to avoid those five five deaths. Yes? Well, besides the monetary cost, No doubt this would increase the demand for chimney sweeps and any other associated industry. But I'm thinking about something more direct that would cost something else. Yes? (laughs) Maybe not all of them, but (laughs) some of them no doubt will because it's inherently hazardous to go crawling around people's roofs. Yes? Well, that's certainly possible, and this, in fact, was an issue with the asbestos regulation. Now we're going to try and remove all the asbestos, and in the process, we're going to put it all into the air. We're stirring it all up. So that, that's, that's been a concern. I don't know the data on that, but yes? So Michael, the increased taxation to pay for the chimney sweepers would lead to loss of income for the homeowners? Well, I'm assuming that it's not, they're not tax-funded. It's just a mandate. You have to go, you have to go do this. So, but it is, it is true that in forcing people to spend money on one thing, they're not going to have the money for something else. So you, you force people to spend, say, $300 a year cleaning out their chimney, and as a result, they don't have the $300 to do something else. And people are not unconcerned with their safety. They're going to try to take their $300 and use it for something that they think is most beneficial for them at that time, which may be increased safety, it may be a vacation, but whatever it is, it's going to increase their personal satisfaction. Yes, one more. Um, operating under the pretense that they're safer from the chimney sweeping, maybe they use the chimney wall. That's certainly true. Yes, I feel like I'm safer, therefore I use it more often. There was a study that indicated that people who use sunscreen don't have lower, lower uh, chances of getting uh, skin cancer. I can't, I can't, that's off the top of my head. I can't put my brain cells on where that came from, but I remember reading that recently. Why would you expect that? Well, I put on sunscreen. I think, well, I'm okay to stay out here a little longer. So as a result, people will change their behavior, which may not increase their overall level of safety. There was a study done, famous study done on seatbelt laws. You require people to put on seatbelts, and you don't really increase or decrease uh, traffic safety, um, traffic accident deaths because people, because they feel safer, they're going to drive a little faster. People engage in in offsetting behaviors, in other words. Okay, so my point is, 
government regulators are not thinking typically about the deaths that they are causing by forcing people to back away from one risk more than people otherwise would. But that's definitely a problem. In fact, again, you have to take this with a grain of salt or, or two or salt shaker of salt, but if you look at actual um, estimates of this kind of thing from, uh, let's see, this is from, I think, an OSHA regulation. Uh, let's see if I can find the data here. Um, I don't see it, but, oh, yes, okay. Um, if you look at the um, amount of uh, production dollars that go toward compensating people for injuries and deaths, that's around 4% of every dollar in production and industry associated with the health and safety costs of that production. So and the asbestos regulation that I mentioned earlier, according to one source that I have, it leads to the loss of 1.5 lives for every expected life saved. We're killing people with this. In the name of trying to save people's lives, we're killing people. Now, I, I do want to qualify this by saying saving lives is not the only objective that's legitimate for people. I trade off my life against a number of other goals that I have. If I, if I devoted more effort into extending my life, I could certainly do so. I, I would eat more healthily. I would drive a different car. I would do all kinds of things in the interest of extending my life. That's not my only goal, though. I have three children. I'd like to see my children well off. I sacrifice things that might benefit my life expectancy in order to see something good for them. That's a legitimate goal. We make these trade-offs all the time. But if you're only concerned about saving lives, it's not clear that regulation is even doing that. Now, again, I'm focusing here on some of the practical problems with regulation. We know that there are ethical problems as well. Even if we could show the number of lives saved from a Chimney Safety Act would be greater than the number of lives lost from chimney sweeps falling off of chimneys and people burning fires in their houses more often, uh, even if we could show that, I'm not convinced that this is ethically permissible you still have a problem with extracting someone's property right from them involuntarily. I think that that's a fatal problem to regulation, the very idea of it. So, if you look at the ability of regulation to save lives, we certainly see problems with this. In some cases, the costs of these regulations are through the roof. If you look at the asbestos ban, from one older study, it cost about $110 million to save one life with the asbestos ban. Now, that's just the life that was saved. Remember, I just said there's 1.5 lives lost, but we're just looking at the one that was saved. Just that, $110 million. <coughs> there's a standard... Drinking water standard, limiting the amount of atrazine that can go into your water. I don't know what atrazine is, but it's apparently if you consume enough of it, then it'll harm you in some way. $92 billion per life saved. I can think of a lot of things to do with $92 billion that would save more lives than reducing atrazine. The limit, by the way, on atrazine, take an aspirin, break it in half, crumble it up, and drop it into a railroad tank car filled with water, that would be equivalent to the maximum amount of atrazine in water. Now, that's, that's a tiny amount. I, yeah, I hope you understand that. So if I, had, if I had crumbled up the entire aspirin tablet and dropped it in the railroad tank car, I've now got twice the permissible amount of atrazine in the water. And now my job is 
as a regulator, I've got to reduce the amount of atrazine. Okay, try to take that other half aspirin out of the water. How hard is that going to be? Um, so th this is uh, one half aspirin per 16,000 gallons. Um, so th this, is, this is extremely devastating, not only to uh, economic growth and business activity, but it's harmful to human life. One other example here, um, Dale Steinrich had an article uh, on gun safety laws. He was actually reviewing a book by John Lott, and John Lott has spent a lot of time looking at gun safety laws and concealed weapons um, regulations and so forth. And, and Lott was spending some time in his book talking about, this This is a book called uh, The Bias Against Guns, Why Almost Everything You've Heard About Gun Control is Wrong. Uh, this book came out in 2003 by John Lott. And there was a while there where you were hearing a lot about gun locks, and you're supposed to go safe, safely store your firearm so that your seven-year-old doesn't wander into the room where the gun is and pick it up and, and do some damage. Well, I'd, I have children. I'd, I'd don't like the thought of something bad happening to them at all, and uh, I, I think it's good to have safety in gun storage. But this is another case where you can back into another risk trying to avoid one. So we, we have this uh, you know, sort of scenario where somebody's got their gun safely locked up, and then somebody's heard breaking in the back window, and you go to find your gun, and okay, and then you got to go find the key and this other key, and then you got to locate how to how to get this thing undone, and then you got to figure out how to load it. And by that time, you know, uh, you're you're done. That's it. Um, I guess you're supposed to go call the police, but like they say, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. <laughs> so, uh, or another one of my favorites is. Um, uh, a gun in, a, in the hand is better than a cop on the phone. <laughs> well, anyway, a government accounting office, general accounting office study found that, that locks were only reliable in thwarting children under the age of seven. And he found that, in fact, these safe storage laws had no effect on accidental gun deaths or aggregate suicide rates. The only consistent effect was to increase rapes, robberies, and burglaries. Now, he did a lot of this kind of statistical analysis, which I don't, I don't think holds a whole lot of water, but it's still interesting in an illustrative and a didactic sense, I think. 3,738 rapes, 21,000 robberies, and almost 50,000 burglaries in the 15 states that enacted safe storage laws. Those, that's the, those are the increases in the numbers of those offenses that Lot attributes to the safe storage laws. Also, in the five-year period after the passage of those laws, Lot found a yearly increase of 309 murders and over 25,000 aggravated assaults, which makes safe storage laws pretty dangerous, in my view. You could find the same kind of effect with a much better-known study, an older study, looking at the regulations that required uh, medications bottles to have a safety cap, a child safety cap. You push down and turn, right? So how could this possibly make people worse off? Well, first, look at what actually happened to poisoning rates. The poisoning rate for analgesic products like Tylenol went from about 1.1 per thousand people in 1971 before the law was passed, to 1.5 per thousand people in 1980. Now, there may have been an increase in the number of sales of Tylenol over that nine-year period that accounts for some of that increase, and, but that only about half of that increase is attributable to the increase in the number of people who had this, these products lying around their houses. But the implication is there were 3,500 additional poisonings every year of children under five because of the child safety caps. How can a child safety cap result in more children being poisoned? 
You don't store it as safely. Sure. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, take, you could leave the cap off. Uh, and, and people would do this. They'd say, oh, well, it's got a child safety cap on it. I can leave it underneath the sink instead of up above out of reach. And so people would do this because it gave them a false sense of security. Or they thought they'd put the cap on, but in fact they hadn't. And you know with these things, it's kind of difficult to know when it's really on and when it's not. So people were made less safe by the regulation. There's empirical evidence. Again, I don't want you to, to count on this too much, but suggests that the newly introduced safety mechanisms for the butane cigarette lighters also reduces the amount of care that people will take to make sure that these things stay out of reach. Now, these are these are points that you might be able to use if you're trying to, to um, have a, a conversation with somebody who, who is arguing that in a free market society, we'd all be dying of the negligence of some kind of manufacturer or other, and if it were not for uh, uh, regulation keeping us safe, then uh, we'd be in, in, in a terrible condition. What would a market do? in the absence of regulation, to improve safety? Well, let me give you several thoughts. There would be, I think, private certification. There are several examples, existing examples today of this kind of thing. Uh, underwriters' laboratories. You see on the back of little electronic devices, a little logo that says UL. What that means is the company has paid some fee to this private organization called Underwriters Laboratories that hires thousands of scientists to evaluate consumer products and find out whether they're likely to catch fire or if they're likely to uh, um, uh, blow up in your face or, or, or something like that. How many of you have ever worried about your television set exploding? Really? Okay. I've never heard of it happening here. Now, we've moved to flat screens. It's a little harder for me to under, uh, understand how a flat screen can, can explode as opposed to one of the old-style cathode ray tube TVs like I grew up with. But in the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, there were people who died every year from exploding TVs. <laughs> This is the government trying to ensure safety and telling people, oh, well, you know, we're, we're mandating safety standards for television manufacturers in the Soviet Union. And, and literally, people died on occasion. It wasn't very common, but people, I've never heard of it here, dying of an exploding TV. So Underwriters Laboratories is a private sector organization, and firms will pay to have the ability to put the little logo on the back of their product. And maybe most people don't pay much attention to this, um, but it is one way of certifying that the product is safe. There may be um, retailers that look at this, say, and, and they say, well, we're not going to stock electronics in our store or household appliances that, that don't have this device. One of the problems that has, has come up is this idea of vicarious liability, that you've got, um, you can buy something from Walmart, you take it home, and it, it um, explodes or something, and you, you don't go after Walmart today, you go after the manufacturer, because that's where the deep pocket is. And Rothbard says that that's completely Ill illegitimate. The, the proper focus of the liability should be the retailer. That, if that were the case, that would probably put the onus on the retailer to be the go-between between the consumer and the manufacturer to ensure safety. And it would remove some of the complaints, I think, that there's this sort of asymmetric information problem between the consumer and the manufacturer. I might not be in a very good position to know what to look for in terms of safety for a toaster oven or a hair dryer or a toothpaste or whatever else other consumer product I buy, 
But the retailer, as a purchaser of thousands of products with a reputation on the line if they sell a bad product and liability if they sell a bad product, would have the incentive to go and look more carefully and more knowledgeably at the uh, risks. There's a good housekeeping seal of approval. I think if you had, the, in the absence of regulation, there'd be more emphasis put on these kinds of private certifying authorities who would say, well, we're going to be able to tell you that we trust this product and our, the value of that symbol on the product is tied to how reliable it is. If they just start selling off their symbol to anybody without looking at it very carefully, people will soon stop recognizing that as, an, as any evidence of safety. What about government inter- information requirements? Well, I don't have a lot of time here, but there's this sort of idea that, well, it can't hurt people to have more information. And so we get the little thing on the side of the cereal box or the can of beans that says nutrition facts. Or you've got some other kind of information that has to be provided by, reg- by law about the characteristics of the product you're providing. I would argue that there are even problems with this. Beyond the, the ethical requirements I've already mentioned, or ethical problems I've already mentioned with uh, interfering in this triangular intervention with a contract between a buyer and a seller. Now, do, does that mean that I think that, that if, uh, if we had, did not have any regulation that you'd, you'd go to the grocery store, there'd be a, a white label with a black word on it that says beans? No, I think there would be information provided to the consumer. But it would be information that is of, of the greatest importance to the consumer. There may be information missing off the label that you think is, is, is valuable, and you may be misled by the information that is there. So I, I do think that markets have this, the, will have an incentive to provide information, but uh, the, uh, having that incentive overwhelmed by regulation does not do the consumer any good. I mentioned the lulling effect, the medicine safety caps, and the gun safe storage laws. That really brings me to an end here. Um, I very much enjoy your attention. I appreciate that, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have uh, out here um, in the um, in the conservatory. <laughs>